The Egyptian gods are three of Yu-Gi-Oh's biggest icons, but sadly it's no secret that they've struggled at competitive tournaments for pretty much their entire existence. In today's video, we're going to cover how the Egyptian gods work, what they do well, and also what shortcomings have prevented them from seeing tournament success throughout the years. And you might recognize that this is a remake of my biggest video ever that I posted five years ago. I feel like if Mortal Kombat is allowed to have three Mortal Kombat 1s and Call of Duty is allowed to have two Modern Warfare 2s, I'm allowed to remake Why Nobody Plays the Egyptian Gods five years later. Before we jump into the individual issues of each Egyptian god, let's talk about one problem that affects all three of them, their summoning condition. While this has become less of an issue with the release of many modern Egyptian god support cards, this still is one of their biggest drawbacks, and for many years it was the number one thing holding them back. Basically, all of them share the following three effects. Requires three tributes to normal summon, cannot be normal set. This card's normal summon cannot be negated, and finally, when normal summon, cards and effects cannot be activated, although in the case of Ra, it says other cards and effects because you still need to be able to use its on summon ability. Two of these are protection effects, and that's wonderful. There aren't too many cards that can negate normal summons besides the Solemns, but there are a lot of cards and effects that your opponent might want to activate when a god card is successfully normal summoned, so it's nice that they all do share these protection effects to hopefully make the summon a bit easier. But remember, you need these protection effects because you have to tribute three monsters to bring out the Egyptian gods, which is a lot more than your average monster asks. Now you might be wondering, what's the difference between tributing three monsters for the normal summon of an Egyptian god versus using three monsters for a Synchro, Xyz, or Link summon? The one big difference between the Egyptian gods and three material extra deck monsters is that you don't have to draw the extra deck monsters. You will never have to worry about trying to draw Trishula when you have three monsters on the board. It's always just sitting there in the extra deck whenever you need it. And you won't have to worry about drawing it when you don't have three monsters when you wouldn't be able to summon it. But with the Egyptian gods, those are two very real situations that you could find yourself in. Now before you get mad at me for comparing the Egyptian gods to a card from another era, note that the playable Egyptian gods were released a lot later than people seem to remember. I know that a lot of people, myself included, had the Egyptian gods with the flavor text back in the day, but the first playable Egyptian god released was Obelisk at the very end of 2010, and then in January of 2011 we got the first playable version of the Winged Dragon of Ra. Want to know when Trishula was released? Also in 2011. And Slifer took until 2012 to get a playable version, so Trishula really was released around the same era as these playable Egyptian god cards. Now that we've covered some of the shared abilities of the Egyptian gods, let's talk about what makes them unique, starting with the Winged Dragon of Ra. The Winged Dragon of Ra cannot be special summoned. All three of the Egyptian gods do have special summon restrictions, but Ra has the worst of the bunch. Several Ra specific support cards can special summon it by ignoring its summoning conditions, but this definitely hurts Ra from a generic support standpoint because you can't just use cards like Call of the Haunted to bring it back. When this card is normal summoned, you can pay life points so that you only have 100 left. This card gains attack and defense equal to the amount of life points paid. Now I know this effect has confused people in the past, so I do want to make one thing absolutely clear. The can in this effect refers to your choice to activate it, not your choice in how many life points are paid. The effect itself is optional, but if you decide to use it, you're always putting yourself to 100 life points. Raw's last effect is you can pay 1000 life points, then target one monster on the field, destroy that target. This effect is pretty straightforward, but notably it's not a once per turn ability. As long as you have the life points to pay, you're allowed to keep activating it over and over again. The Winged Dragon of Ra has been a glass cannon since day one. While it's great that your opponent can't directly respond to its normal summon, they're still free to use quick effects when there's an open game state after that resolves. Ra is great at dodging cards like Trenchal Tribute, but it's powerless against even basic interruptions like Regeki Break. And I've never been a big fan of the destruction effect either, while a non-once-per-turn pop or 1,000 life points is fantastic, having it stuck on a 3-tribute monster is pretty awkward. Not to mention that if you don't pay life points to give Ra attacks that you have life points to pop cards, you're stuck with a 0-attack Ra. At that point, just play Regeki or Dark Hole. It's worth mentioning, though, that Konami has thrown quite a lot of support towards Ra over the last couple of years in an attempt to make it somewhat playable. Many of those cards were even deliberately designed to solve some of these issues that I'm talking about, too. You can make Ra unaffected by card effects, so it's less susceptible to removal. You can give raw attack points based on what monsters you tributed so that the popping effect isn't attached to a zero attack monster, and there's a bunch of consistency boosting cards to help you assemble the correct combo pieces early on. Sadly, even with all the support that Ra has gotten over the past five years, it hasn't really been able to be competitively successful. It's still a fun glass cannon deck and raw sphere mode is pretty good, but most of the actual raw combos take too many cards for not enough payoff. Let's take a look at what unique effects Obelisk has though. Once per turn during 
during the end phase, if this card was special summoned, send it to the graveyard. Obelisk and Slifer both share this downside, and while it's not as bad as Raw's, it's definitely not ideal. Neither player can target this card with card effects. This is without a doubt the best effect on Obelisk. Modern monster cards have a variety of other protection effects, and protection effects in general are a lot more common. But by 2011 standards, this was a pretty annoying effect, especially on Obelisk, a 4,000 attack point monster. So if you wanted to play Obelisk, this was the big selling point. Finally, you contribute two monsters, destroy all monsters your opponent controls. This card cannot declare an attack the turn this effect is activated. This flashy anime effect unfortunately didn't translate that well to the TCG. There are better ways at clearing the board than summoning a three tribute monster and then tributing another two monsters. They eventually released a spell card that directly benefits from this effect being used, but even in that case, it's still not worth it. The main thing holding Obelisk back is that it just doesn't do enough. It's 4,000 attack and it can't be targeted, but that's about it. That means that its value is entirely dependent on how strong a non-targetable 4,000 attack monster is in that format. And unfortunately for Obelisk, even in that category, it has tough competition. Every time we get a new card like Clifford Towers or Rival Adagnister, Obelisk looks even worse by comparison. These cards have better summoning conditions, better protection effects, and better on-field abilities. And I think for this reason, Obelisk has really struggled in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Ra might be a lot worse on paper compared to Obelisk, but because it's gotten 10 plus support cards, it's a lot easier to play as an actual deck. That being said, I did want to acknowledge that in the early 2010s, Obelisk did pop up every once in a while in Frog decks as a one-of in main decks or in Dragon Ruler decks as a one-of in side decks. In the Dragon Ruler mirror match, it was a pretty interesting tech option because Draco Sack could summon two tokens really easily, and then you could tribute the two tokens and the Draco Sack for Obelisk, and in the mirror, it was really hard to deal with because you couldn't use Big Eye or Draco Sack to remove it. Obelisk wasn't popular in those formats, and it wasn't a standard option for those decks, but it did pop up a couple times, and I wanted to mention it. Hopefully, Konami throws Obelisk a few more cards in the future, but until then, it's unlikely to perform well at events. Finally, that brings us to Slifer the Sky Dragon, which happens to be my favorite Egyptian god card. This one says, once per turn during the end phase, if this card was special summoned, send it to the graveyard. This is the same drawback as Obelisk the Tormentor, and it has the same problems as that. It is cool that you can bring it back for at least one turn, but it won't stick around forever, and that definitely hurts, because it means that you're going to want to tribute summon the Slifer the Sky Dragon properly if you want to keep it around. Gains 1,000 attack and defense for each card in your hand. 1,000 was pretty much set in stone by the anime, but I think it scales decently well in the TCG. In my mind, Slifer is usually okay as long as it has at least 2,000 attack points, but it's cool that you can boost it to an insane number if you really want to go for an OTK. If a monster is normal or special summoned to your opponent's field and attack position, that monster loses 2,000 attack, then if its attack has been reduced to zero as a result, destroy it. In my opinion, this is the best effect on any of the Egyptian god cards. It's not an unbeatable floodgate because it doesn't negate the monster's effects and also your opponent can still just summon things in defense mode to play around it, but realistically it's a decent floodgate against a variety of matchups. It also got even better with the release of link monsters because those can't be summoned in defense mode, so they're always going to be destroyed by the Slifer if they have 2,000 or less attack. Perhaps the biggest downside of Slifer is that it has no protection effects. It's cool against opposing engine cards if your opponent is just throwing a bunch of monsters at it, but it immediately crumbles against virtually any generic spell card like Regeki, Dark Hole, or Triple Tactics Talent. Not to mention that nowadays a lot of monster cards have graveyard effects, which Slifer isn't very good against. Another drawback that it has is that many of the combos that summon Slifer take a lot of the cards out of your hand. Both Obelisk and Ra don't really care about you having card advantage, but Slifer demands it if you want to give it attack points. The goal for Slifer players has always been trying to figure out the most consistent way to bring out Slifer while using the least amount of cards, but sometimes that's easier said than done. Konami did give Slifer one insanely powerful normal trap card that's seen some experimentation in branded decks, but even with that trap, Slifer still hasn't made any impact at tournaments. The Egyptian God cards are awesome, iconic monsters that all suffer from a few major drawbacks. While I appreciate Konami giving these cards support every so often, I also think it'd be cool to finally give them extra deck monster retrains. One of the biggest reasons that these cards haven't been successful is simply that they're three tribute main deck monsters. Building an entire main deck around Egyptian Gods has always been a challenge, but it might be nice to see them get retrains as big extra deck finishers. Maybe that's a little bit too out there though, I'm just kind of wishful thinking here. At the very least, I'd like to see some obelisk support that maybe doesn't suck as much. That being said, if you do want to learn more about the Egyptian God support that has been released, just a few months ago I made a video covering every single piece of Egyptian God support. Make sure to check that out, I'll link it at the end of this video. I'll see you guys later, thanks so much for watching, goodbye.